Hey everyone, before we begin I want to do a few things that were remiss of me not to do in the first part. First of all, I want to give a big shout out to my friend Plus Ultraman, who not only suggested this topic to me, but has also helped me with both writing and planning this series. Secondly, I'd like to ask you all to subscribe, since currently, less than a quarter of my viewers are subscribed. While I could give you the sales pitch about how it helps me, and make sure you never miss out on an upload, I'll instead draw inspiration from this story's protagonist, and just say this, subscribe and join my crew today. But with that out of the way, Let's get on to the story. We resume with the Straw Hats once more on the high seas, though this time they are travelling aboard the rather ramshackle Dreadnought Sabre, having taken it from the Barate, now that its previous owner is dead. Unfortunately, due to its poor condition, it is not able to carry them all the way to Arlong Park, beginning to sink a few miles off the coast, and forcing the crew to stand atop the mast and jump down onto land as soon as the tides carry them near enough. Be it fair fortune or foul, it seems that fate has deposited them in the ruins of Goza Village, right where several lesser members of the Arlong Pirates are situated. In their bullish manner, the the fishmen taunt the humans, calling them an inferior species. That is until Corot and Gein take them out, wordlessly spring into action and dropping their foes with a slashing of blades and spinning of tonfa. The group then hear a gasp, and spinning in preparation to find another fishman, they instead spot a human woman with pale blue hair who stares up at them with a look of utter shock. In a voice that sounds both impressed and scared, this stranger states that she can't believe they'd fight those fishmen, since if word gets out, Arlong will bring a terrible vengeance down upon them all. Just look at what he did to this village for defying him. Shrugging this off, Luffy asks if the woman knows a girl named Nami, saying she's their friend and they're looking for her, to which the woman knowingly states they must be her latest set of marks, telling them to go home since they won't be getting Nami or their money back, before filling them in on Nami's status as an Arlong pirate and the way the fishermen have taken control of this whole island. Pushing up his glasses with a look of smug superiority, Kuro gloats that he told Straw Hat the wench was no good, though with a hint of annoyance, the blue-haired woman retorts that the wench is her sister, stating that her name is Nojiko. In his gruffly polite way, Gein states they meant no disrespect, though before more can be said, the sound of a gunshot ringing out in the distance draws everyone's attention. Rushing to the neighbouring Kokiyashi village, the Straw Hats and Nojiko see a scarred man with a pinwheel on his hat lying dead in the street, having apparently been shot by Arlong for illegally hoarding weapons. Rushing to the man's Side, Nojiko weeps over her father figure's body, while in the distance, the Straw Hats see the retreating backs of the Arlong pirates, many of whom appear to be laughing. Though this is upsetting for everyone, no one is angrier than Kobe, who growls that he'll make Arlong pay, knowing firsthand the anguish of being under the thumb of a dictatorial pirate, while beside him, Shushu nuzzles his friend in an attempt to comfort his evident distress. A little while later, Nami comes to town to pay her respects to the man who the Straw Hats have learned was named Genzo. Evidently, none of the villagers are happy to see her, with most either glaring or acting as if they do not see her, though in spite of everything, Luffy makes a beeline for his former navigator as soon as he lays eyes on her, demanding to know whether what Nojiko said is true and she really is one of the bad guys. Forcing herself to be aloof, Nami confirms this, saying she only pretended to join his crew to swindle him, so he should leave. However, Luffy refuses to buy this, yelling that he can see she's in pain, which means she really does care, a statement which causes Nami to storm off before she lets slip how she really feels. Seeing the crew really do care about Nami and not just getting their money back, Nojiko shares the story of her mother Belmare's death with them, before adding that since that day, Nami's been gathering a hundred million berries so she can buy the village back from Arlong, like he promised, and protect everyone. Empathetically, Kobe muses how much Genzo's death must weigh on her then, with Gin agreeing, stating it's an unimaginable pain to fail to protect someone precious. Even Kuro has no snide comments this time, with the four Straw Hats following Nojiko back to her home, where they find Nami crying over Belmare's grave, her voice breaking as she plants Genzo's pinwheel beside it and apologizes for not getting the money sooner. Though he had intended to from the moment he heard what Arlong had done to Nami and Nojiko's family, the sight of someone he considers a friend in pain finally confirms to Luffy they have to take Arlong down. To this end, he steps forward, laying his hat on Nami's head as he promises that he will free her village. He then tells his crew to come with him, and having already sworn vengeance, Kobe has no objection, moving to Luffy's side, while Gein, Kuro, and Chushu fall in step with the boys, beginning their walk to Arlong Park. Due to deciding to fight Arlong sooner, there is no mob waiting outside the gate when they arrive, with it coming as a shock to the fishman tyrant when Luffy kicks in his gate. Nonetheless, Arlong remains confident in his superiority, not even rising from his deck chair as he tells his men to take out this human trash. However, here too he is in for a surprise, as when one of his lieutenants, an octopus fishman named Hachi, summons a giant sea cow to eat the humans, Luffy grabs it and uses it as a makeshift club, clearing away the rank and file members of the crew and leaving only Arlong, Hachi, 
and his two other strongest officers, Karubi and Chu. Deciding to divide and conquer, the Arlong pirates split up to face the humans, with the ever-tactical Chu calling dibs on Kobe, having deemed him the weakest link. Bending down to suck up a mouthful of pool water, Chu then begins firing off a volley of water bullets at the boy, causing him to yelp and run with Shu Shu beside him, his motivation being both fear and a desire to try and lead him away from a water source, in the hope that this will level the playing field. Meanwhile, Hachi has chosen to engage Luffy, throwing chunks of the debris at him, only for Kuro to step in, stating he's afraid he can't let the octopus fishman kill the rubber boy, since if he's not the one to kill Straw Hat, that indirectly proves him right, which frankly speaking is an unstomachable outcome. The former captain of the Black Cat Pirates then advances on his prey, his cat claws reflecting off the pool water, while Hachi meets him with six swords of his own, declaring himself the second best swordsman on Fishman Island. However, the act of fighting with six swords at once requires more than just skill, needing also a high degree of concentration and the ability to hold multiple tasks in one's mind at the same time while shifting focus between them deftly, making this a battle of brain power just as much as physical strength. Recognizing this, Kuro is confident his intellect is far higher than his opponent's, and so uses this to his advantage, striking from different directions at the same time, before rapidly changing trajectory in a way that forces Hachi to split his attention between all six of his arms, because he cannot keep up with Kuro's mental gymnastics. As a result, Hachi soon finds himself spread too thin, growing confused and sloppy, thus creating an opening for Kuro to use his newest technique, a move he'd devised to kill Straw Hat, which he has dubbed Kitten Whiskers. Lunging forward, the bloodthirsty doctor interlocks his fingers, creating two rows of blades which impale Hachi in ten places at once, including arms, legs, and center mass, disabling them all. This deals massive damage as the octopus fishman is lifted off his feet and launched into the pool, with Kuro assuming one of the chest wounds will kill him soon enough. As this has been happening, Gin has been trying with little success to help get Luffy's feet unstuck from the concrete they'd been buried in after lifting the weight of the sea cow. However, it seems that now he will have another task, as spotting the Straw Hat Captain's vulnerable position, Arlong wastes no time in pulling the entire slab from the ground and tossing it into the pool, laughing maniacally as he does that now the boy's devil fruit will be his undoing. He then adds that this really is just further proof that humans are inferior to fishmen, since they can't even breathe underwater. But ignoring this barb, Gein leaps headfirst into the water, refusing to fail another captain. Meanwhile, Kobe has finally led Chu far enough from the water that he feels confident he can fight him, skidding to a stop and striking the smelt whiting fishman with his pipe. Unfortunately, even without water, Chu is still ten times stronger than a human, while Kobe is only just starting to see the effects of Luffy's training compensating for his natural scrawniness. As a result, this does very little to Chu, with him kicking the boy into a nearby copse of trees, before beginning to pepper the tree line with the leftover water in his mouth. Landing hard, Kobe has to throw himself forward to push Shu Shu out of harm's way, though it is clear they're still both in a lot of danger. Smugly, Chu tells them to just give up and die quickly, since there's no way a primate and a canine can beat the superior might of a fish man. Though, this gives Kobe an idea, with him using Chu's hubris against him, by coordinating with Shu Shu to have the dog flank the fish man, since he won't be expecting them to have a strategy, let alone a multi-layer one. As a result, Chu is blindsided when Shu Shu bursts into view further down the tree line and attempts to bite him, though truthfully, this is just a diversion, as Kobe, who is used to being underestimated and ignored, now emerges from the direction he isn't looking to unleash a volley of rapid succession whacks to the fishman's head with his pipe. Needing this to work or else he and Shu Shu are dead, Kobe is more than a little panicked, and this is reflected in his hits, with adrenaline giving them strength and precision as he bludgeons the Arlong Lieutenant until he is more lump than man, or rather, fish man. Back in the pool, Gein has managed to rapidly sink to the bottom thanks to his ton for acting as weights, though this is less beneficial a moment later, as before he can use them to smash the concrete and free Luffy, he is assailed by the final officer of the Arlong Pirates, Karubi. Being a ray fish man, the water is Karubi's domain, whereas Gein quickly finds himself at a massive disadvantage, as not only must he defend himself and his immobilized captain in this inhospitable environment, but he must also do so with weapons whose weight and drag in the water make them far harder to use. As a result, Karubi quickly gains an edge in this fight pummeling Gein with ruthless efficiency, though as you will soon learn, he is not the only one versed in ruthlessness, as when Gein pulls out his man-demon tactics, things begin to change. By spinning his tonfer at high enough speeds, Gein is able to overcome the issue of weight and drag, managing to even turn them into propellers, which he can use to push himself at speeds rivaling the fishman, while also turning this momentum into mass, and therefore power, when he strikes him with the weighted balls. Evidently, Kruby did not expect this pushback, though it is already too late to retreat, as Gein is not a man to start something without finishing it. In this case, his finishing blow comes in the form of a momentum-powered knee to Kruby's gut, which causes him to double over, leaving his head in the perfect position to be sandwiched between the heads of his two tonfer 
Tifa as he slams them together, naming the move the Pina Collider. Now with Karubi down for the count, Gin can at last free Luffy, who coughs and splutters as he's brought back to the surface before thanking the ruffian for the assist. Nonetheless, he declares his intention to finish off Arlong personally, tasking Kuro and Gin with checking on Kobe as he's been gone for a while now. Noting their understanding, the two men depart, allowing Luffy to fight Arlong, with the brawl going much like in canon, albeit slightly easier for Luffy as he is slightly stronger than his canon self. Nonetheless, it is still an intense clash, with Luffy having to retreat into Nami's room, it is only upon learning that this is the place where Arlong kept his friend enslaved that he is finally able to bring the fight to an end, destroying the room, the tower, and Arlong's hold on the island. In the aftermath of the Straw Hats' victory, a massive party is held in Kokuyashi Village, with everyone celebrating the defeat of the Arlong pirates. Though unbeknownst to them, one of the officers did escape, that being Hachi, who thanks to his fishman anatomy was not struck in any vital areas by Kuro's finishing move, allowing him to flee through the canal between the pool and the open ocean, before coming back up just outside the village. Having never had anything against the humans personally, he attempts to make amends for the actions of his crew by cooking up a batch of his famous takoyaki, which he tries to smuggle into the party. However, there is one problem with this. One greedy gluttonous problem named Monkey D. Luffy, who after coming across the fishmen carrying piles of food, decides to try one of the octopus balls for himself. He then decides to try another, and another, quickly coming to adore Hachi's cooking and demanding he join his crew as the chef. Truthfully, the octopus fishman is taken aback by this offer, having never expected to be forgiven for his crimes so quickly or accepted by a human, though having nowhere else to go, and glad someone appreciates his cooking, he decides to accept the offer, though only on the proviso Luffy stops eating his stack of takoyaki, as he's already devoured one quarter of what is supposed to be his peace offering. Laughing, Luffy says this is fine, since now that Hachi's part of his crew, he can just have him make him takoyaki whenever he wants and in spite of himself, the fishman laughs too, thinking to himself that his new boss is a weird but kind of funny guy. As for Nami, when asked to join the Straw Hats for real, she refuses, stating that while she did truly have fun with them, she wants to stay here and look after the people of the village, like her mother and Genzo did. Though he doesn't like this answer, Luffy finally accepts it, stating that the villagers are a true Nakama, as he reclaims his beloved straw hat from her and bids her goodbye as a friend. When the party finally ends the following morning, the Straw Hat Pirates take their leave, boarding the Bezan Black which was moored near Arlong Park. This is also where Kobe, Crow, and Gein learn that Hachi will be joining as their chef, and while Kobe and Gein are willing to let bygones be bygones, Crow is skeptical of letting the former Arlong Pirate come aboard. However, his objections are promptly drowned out by a spate of teasing from Gein, who suggests the doctor's just worried he's losing his touch, since his special new technique failed to actually kill anyone. With this settled, the crew set sail, now for Logtown, as their last stop before entering the Grand Line. Though before they even reach land, they are greeted by big news, when a few days later, a series of wanted posters fall from that day's newspaper, showing that Luffy has gotten himself a bounty of 30 million berries, with Kobe stating that one of the marines who took Arlong away after the battle must have requested that Luffy be given a bounty of his own. Here Kuro also finds that his bounty has been reactivated, and is annoyed that it remained at 16 million, just over half of Luffy's. Though Gin replies that his is only 12 million, so Kuro shouldn't complain as he's still the second highest, while Hodge confirms that his is 8 million. Kobe can't help but feel a little left out having no bounty, despite being first mate. But Luffy laughs that if he keeps training and beating more strong pirates like Chu, he'll have one in no time. Following this, the Straw Hats finally arrive in Logtown, where they decide to split up, with Kuro, Gin, and Hachi going to gather supplies for the next leg of their trip, while Luffy and Kobe visit Gold Roger's execution site. Luffy being Luffy, he decides to climb up onto the execution platform despite Kobe's protests, and while there, a woman he doesn't recognize calls out to him, revealing herself to be a drastically changed Alvida, who expresses admiration for the rubber boy as the only man who's ever defeated her. Unfortunately, she's not the only old face, as at that moment, the buggy pirates swoop in and put Luffy's head on the block, ordering his execution, while Alvida muses that she hopes Luffy can get out of this mess, since otherwise he's really not worth her attention. Desperately, Kirby tries to save his captain, even briefly overcoming his fear of Alvida to strike her with his pipe in the hope Buggy will forget Luffy and try to help his ally. Unfortunately, this slips right off her as she reveals that she has eaten the slip slip fruit, before telling Buggy they'll be taking Kirby with them when this little show's over, since she's missed having her cabin boy at her beck and call. The prospect of returning to his life of subjugation under Alvida freezes Kirby with terror, and so it takes seeming divine intervention in the form of a lightning strike to save Luffy, with the two boys quickly fleeing for their lives as Alvida and the buggy pirates follow in hot pursuit. However, it seems that they are not the only chasers, as Captain Smoker of the Marines, along with his subordinate Toshigi, attempt to apprehend all the pirates, refusing to allow any to escape. Being something of a bungler, Buggy quickly falls into their clutches, though Luffy and Kobe do manage to make it onto the Bezan Black, with Alvida accidentally following suit, while Smoker is distracted by a hooded man. Fortunately, 
Luckily, everyone else is already waiting for them, and so not wanting to be caught in the sudden storm or by Smoker, the Straw Hats disembark. They're heading Reverse Mountain. Here Alvita proves to be a surprising asset, as with her volunteering to handle navigation so that Gein can focus on the helm, the Bezan Black is able to make it to the mountain and begin their high-speed ascent up its watery slope while her crew hang on for dear life. Then, as if passing into a new world, they shoot past the storm clouds, finding themselves in clear skies, with the seemingly endless expanse of the Grand Line stretching out before them.